here to talk about the lifestyle treatment of type 2 diabetes. And uh, what I'd like to do is to show you where type 2 diabetes comes from. Uh, once you understand where diabetes, type 2 diabetes comes from, it'll be easier to understand how to treat it. It is a lifestyle disease, and so it really needs a lifestyle treatment. While you may gain help from medications, they're not going to solve the problem. You have to change the lifestyle. So we'll, we'll try to make it uh, relatively easy to understand and uh, help you on this journey. Well, <clears throat> you like my artwork? Uh, on the left there, is, it's supposed to be a stomach. You see the esophagus there? And over on the far right-hand side, that's supposed to be a busy cell. This is uh, normal physiology. We're going to look at how energy is managed in the body. When energy comes into the body, it comes into our mouth, right? Goes down the esophagus into the stomach. And the stomach is a big muscular sac, not that big, a muscular sac which mixes up the food, makes a little acid, helps some of the digestion process get started. Then the food is uh, uh, kind of pushed on down to the small intestine. And from there, uh, the energy is absorbed into the blood vessels. Do you know where the blood vessels of the body go? Somebody says, all over. Yes, I suppose fingernails and hair accepted. Maybe the cornea, another place. But most of the body, the blood goes there. One of the places where the blood goes with the energy in it is to a little organ called the uh, pancreas. It sits behind the stomach. And the pancreas has a couple jobs. One is to make digestive enzymes. And the other is to make hormones to help the body manage energy. Now, the hormone that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today, I like to call the Paul Revere hormone. Have you all heard of Paul Revere? He was famous, if I remember correctly, for, uh, for riding his uh, horse from uh, Boston to Lexington, saying something like, the British are coming or the red coats or something, right? And so the Paul Revere hormone is put out by the pancreas and runs all through the body with the message, the energy's coming. You've probably heard of that hormone as insulin. Insulin is the messenger hormone to let the cells of the body, all the busy cells of the body, know that the energy is on its way. If there's a little bit of energy coming out, the body says, the energy is coming. If there is a lot of energy coming, the body says, the energy is coming. <laughs> so the message is a little louder if there's a lot of energy. That's how it normally works. Let us pretend. Let us pretend that I am running a marathon race. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. I've carbohydrate loaded. I'm well hydrated. I am ready for the race. Bang, the gun goes off and I start to run. Which muscles in my body are doing most of the work? Is it not those quadricep muscles? As I'm racing. What are my muscles, quadricep muscles, using for an energy source? Do you all know? Well, I carbohydrate loaded, so there's some glycogen in there. My, my muscles can burn a little bit of fat, but they're not going to get that much fat that quick. They like the sugar or the glucose to run on. And so the glycogen stored in my muscles helps my muscles do the running. And they do pretty good for the first mile. As a matter of fact, they do pretty good for the second mile, third, fourth mile. They're getting a little bit hungry. They're looking around and beginning to run out of energy. Right along the road while I'm running my race is a table. And on that table is something, it's, it's in a plastic bottle. It says Gatorade. What's in Gatorade? Yeah. Oh, there's some energy there. Good. There's also salt, electrolytes to help replace what I've been sweating out. And well, we talked about the energy already. And water, because I need to stay hydrated. So I grab a bottle, and I glug it down, and it goes down into the stomach and mixes up into the blood vessels to the pancreas. Little energy or a lot of energy? A lot of energy. So my pancreas says, Energy's coming! 
What do you think my thigh muscles say? Give it to me, I want it now. And my thigh muscles open wide up to let the energy in. Oops, that wasn't what I was expecting. Okay. There they go. Okay. See all the little glucose transporters? They're waiting inside the cell. And when that, that uh, Paul Revere hormone signals to that cell, the energy is coming, these little glucose transporters go to the cell wall, and then the energy, the sugar, goes into the cell, and the cells can use it. The, uh, that's what that previous slide was. Let me uh, show you that again. There it is. These are those, uh, there's the insulin up there on the upper right-hand corner, touching the uh, uh, insulin receptor, it makes some changes inside the cell and these glucose transporters which have been waiting in the cell move to the cell wall and let the sugar in. Pretty slick system. Now don't you worry, don't you worry. This thing over here that says IRS, it has nothing to do with the government, okay? <laughs> Just wanted you to, uh, not to worry about that. There's also another signal that goes to the nucleus and helps to up and down regulate the uh, uh, genes that involve this whole process. Okay, so there they are, uh, my thigh muscle cells with all that energy coming in, just overjoyed to have all that energy, and they, they open the cell wide up to let the sugar in. What about my eye blinkers? What do eye blinkers do in the middle of a race? They just clean the windshield, right? And it really doesn't matter whether I'm watching TV or reading a book or running a race. The eye blinkers are just cleaning the windshield. So when all this uh, noise is going around and the energy is coming, <laughs> message goes out through the whole body, the thigh muscles are, well, they want that stuff, they open wide up. What do you think the little eye blinkers say? It's okay, I'll, I'll take some. <laughs> Why, not me too? <laughs> Why not me too, sort of thing. You've just learned a very important physiologic lesson, and that is each cell in the body decides how much energy it needs and adjusts a relative insulin sensitivity or a resistance. So when we take energy in, that energy is distributed in the body according to need. It's like the perfect communism, right? Nobody takes more than they, they just take what they need. If there's a little bit that goes in, it's distributed according to need. If there's a lot, it's distributed according to need. It's a, a, a good system. The mouth does not control what happens with energy. Why do you put things in your mouth? Somebody says, I'm hungry. Okay. Some people says, for nutrition. I said, now you're kind of an odd one, if that's the case. Uh, <clears throat> there are some people, and I, I, you, I'm sure, don't know any of these people. There are some people who eat simply because they're bored, or because it's been a hard day at the office, or I just deserve it, or it tastes good or it smells good. I mean, things go into our mouth sometimes because mama said, you're not getting up from the table until you finish what's on your plate. Mm -hmm. See? So energy control is not the mouth. Energy control is not in the stomach. Energy control is not in the blood vessels. Energy control is not in the pancreas. Energy control is in each of the cells. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Important first principle for normal by design. Well, now that we understand how normal works, we can talk a little bit about uh, diabetes, type 2. Here it goes. We've got a problem with diabetes type 2. We have, instead of busy cells, we have lazy cells. I'd like you to go on another uh, imaginary journey with me, this time to a living room, a recliner. <laughs> As a matter of fact, think couch potato. <laughs> couch potato, I see a recliner with a big screen TV, two remotes. I see a table with a lamp, a bowl of, I think there was ice cream in there, it's gone now. <clears throat> There's a second six pack of something. On the other side of the chair is a, I think it's a tray of Oreos with one and a half of the rows gone. I hear crinkly sounds. Is that Cheetos or is that <laughs> potato <laughs> chips? <laughs> is that a little energy or is that a lot of energy? That's a lot of energy. 
And somebody, if, if I know the couch potatoes, somebody else got the second six-pack for them. The strongest muscles are those necessary to open the bag of Cheetos, the next bag, or pop the tab on the next can of whatever. So, uh, <clears throat> lazy cells with lots of energy. What do you think happens? Well, notice the arrows are a little bigger this time. In the stomach, the arrows are bigger. It goes into the small intestine, into the blood vessels to the pancreas. And what do you think the pancreas says? You're right. The energy is coming! <laughs> as loud as it can, because there is so much energy coming. What do you think the thigh muscles of the couch potato say to all that energy? <laughs> well, let's pretend it's polite, okay? <laughs> no, thank you. Well, it might let a little bit in, but with time, if we keep so much energy coming and so little exercise, so little work to do, the cell says no thank you louder and finally reaches the point where it is saying no. Now, <clears throat> this is not an abnormal genetic process. This is simply normal physiology. The body should be able to adjust, but if there's way too much energy coming in and no need for it, this is the body's way of dealing it. Each cell says no, no, no. And when they're all saying no, or almost all saying no, we say that the whole body has something called insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance, I suppose the insulin is the Paul Revere hormone saying, the energy is coming, and the cells are saying no, no. How does the body respond to that? Well, the first thing that happens, we start seeing the insulin levels going up, 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 up. Now, I know this one has an insulin level of 5. I've seen insulin levels as high as 12, 16, 18. They get up there really high, but there is a maximum. Uh, you just can't put out 100% blood as insulin, right? So there is a maximum where the pancreas can put out. And when the pancreas can't yell any louder, can't make the cells take any more, then we begin to see another change. We begin to see the blood sugars going up. Normal blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, should be less than 100. It starts to sneak up as the body has a harder and harder time putting all that energy away. And it goes up until it passes that magic line, 125 milligrams per deciliter. When the sugar, the fasting blood sugar goes over that line, the doctor says, you've got diabetes. Now, when I was in medical school, that line was at 140 milligrams per deciliter. Do you think that's fair for them to be changing the rules midstream? I don't think it's fair. Well, the reason they're doing that is because we're discovering that this is a process and we can start doing something sooner and hopefully keep the problems from coming later. The earlier you do something about it, the easier it is to stop it. The longer you wait, the harder it is to stop it. Does that make sense? You're learning some very important lessons. You're learning that you don't catch diabetes. You're learning that you earn diabetes. You earn it by sitting on your duff and feeding your face. You know about that reflex, don't you? A lot of us have it. Elbow bends, mouth opens. <laughs> we keep putting food in, too much energy in, not enough energy out, and the body's natural response is to develop insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, insulin levels go up, when the body can no longer get the sugar away and the insulin can't go up any higher, then we start to see the sugars go up. And then we finally make the diagnosis. How long does it take to get from the beginning of this process all the way to diabetes? It depends. <laughs> it depends on how many times you have a New Year's resolution and go on a diet and lose weight. It depends on how much exercise you get. It depends on, really, your lifestyle. And as you try to do things that are better, you can actually turn the, slow this process down. You can actually reverse this process. I like to say, every pound you gain is a step towards diabetes. 
Every pound you lose is a step away. That's a good way to look at it. So here's the process. Uh, the normal physiologic response to too much energy in and not enough energy out. Let's go on and look at it a little more. Why doesn't the body want the sugar in the blood? What's the big deal? Let's let the sugar run in the blood. That won't cause any trouble, will it? Well, it does. It causes something that we call small blood vessel disease. And the small blood vessels begin to get plugged up. There's about four different mechanisms involved in this. The biochemistry is now worked out, so we understand a lot more about how it happens. If those small blood vessels are damaged in your eyes, that can lead to blindness. Small blood vessels should be carrying blood. If they are getting narrower and narrower, then uh, there's not enough oxygen and food for the cells in the eye, and the cells in the eye start sending out little messages. We need more oxygen, we need more food. So the body starts to build new blood vessels. That sounds like a good idea, except new blood vessels are kind of weak and they break easily. If they break, there's bleeding. Diabetes is the most common cause of blindness. That's why somebody with diabetes is it's recommended they see their eye doctor every 6 to 12 months. And the eye doctor will look inside, and if he or she sees any of those new blood vessels, they'll zap them with a laser, trying to kind of knock them out before they decide they're going to bleed. So, blindness. In the kidneys, small blood vessel diseases causes the kidneys damage. The little uh, tufts of uh, filtering blood vessels in the kidneys die one by one. They start to leak. And diabetes is the most common cause of kidney failure in this country. Now, some of the big nerves, especially that sciatic nerve, has a little blood vessel that goes with it to uh, supply it with nutrition. If that little blood vessel is plugged up, if the blood isn't flowing well, that nerve starts to complain, and we call it neuropathy. It might feel like sharp pain, it might feel like uh, you're walking on pebbles, or there's cotton on the bottom of your feet. It might be numb. It's all neuropathy. It comes in a lot of different kind of sensations, if you will, but it's all a nerve complaining because it doesn't have enough nutrition. It doesn't have enough oxygen. And of course, that scary one, if there's small blood vessel disease in the feet, and boy, I've seen it. Somebody cuts themselves a little bit, had one patient who kind of took a piece of skin from a callus and kind of pulled it, a little bit of blood, it got infected, and because the couldn't get enough blood in there, because the small blood vessel disease, to fight the infection, the infection starts to win. And if that keeps growing and going, it turns into gangrene, and oh man, amputation time. Uh, diabetes is the most common cause of amputation in this country. So, <clears throat> You can see these small blood vessel diseases are a significant problem. And aren't you glad our body tries to get the sugar out? Well, it's getting the sugar out uh, by uh, putting out lots of insulin. Which comes first, high sugars or high insulin? People often say high sugars, but we've just laid out the story for you that it's really the high insulin that comes first. And we see the effects of the insulin sometimes 10 or 15 years before we see the blood sugars going up. Insulin levels go up first. And insulin levels themselves cause problems. Here's the first one. Insulin is a growth hormone. That is insulin to make us get bigger. It puts fat in the cells, so we get fatter. It, puts, it, it does put protein in the cells and tend to make up more muscle, more structure as well. It also tends to, uh, of course, put the carbohydrate or the sugar in the cell. So insulin is a growth hormone. Oh, I've seen this numerous times. Some uh, fella who was doing varsity sports in college and... and uh, Graduated, got himself a job in a Fortune 500 company, uh, does fine, you know, exercises, gains a little weight, exercises, and it comes off. And at 45 years of age, he comes into my office and says, Doc, I don't understand it. When I was young, I could exercise and get that weight off. Now, it just keeps going up and doesn't seem to come off. I know what's happening. His insulin levels are going up. And if your insulin level's up, it's next to impossible to lose weight. 
because insulin is making the, the, the weight go up. So <clears throat> insulin resistance is a significant problem. High insulin levels tend to make us get larger. I know that when I put somebody who has diabetes on insulin, they're going to gain 15 pounds within the next uh, a month or two because insulin is a growth hormone. Yes, sir? I would suppose there's a test just to measure insulin. Oh, yes, we can do blood tests for that. It's not normally done, is it? It's not done uh, commonly. Uh, I was at the 1997 uh, consensus conference on this insulin resistant syndrome, the kind of the pre-diabetes, in Los Angeles. And I heard them spend half a day arguing about that. Why can't we do the insulin levels? Here's the reason. If we measure an insulin level fasting and it's up, we can say you've got the problem. If it's normal, we can't say you don't have the problem. That is, it's not sensitive. We call it false negatives, right? So what we've had to do is make that diagnosis looking for the evidence of the high insulin levels. So we do that with weight by looking at abdominal circumference. For a man, if your abdominal circumference in this country is over 40 inches, that reaches the criterion. More on that later. Second thing, insulin is highly associated with elevated blood pressure. What do you think might make that happen? Well, insulin tends to make the kidneys hang on to sodium. Water follows the sodium, so there's more water in the pipes. If there's more water in the pipes, that would make the pressure go up, wouldn't it? Another piece of this is the insulin resistance itself, which tends to make the blood vessels less likely to expand. They tend to be a little tighter with insulin resistance. Now we have smaller pipes and more fluid. Voila, higher blood pressure. So there's a strong association with people with essential hypertension and high insulin levels. So those uh, things have been uh, demonstrated. Another thing that insulin does, almost directly, is to stimulate cholesterol production and the production of something called LDL. That is the bad cholesterol. At the same time it's pushing up cholesterol and bad cholesterol, it's pushing down the good cholesterol or the HDL. That sounds like a perfect recipe for a heart attack. Boy, that's no fun, is it? Put them together. We're seeing kind of the picture, if you will, of prediabetes and the problem of a high insulin level, which comes often years before the sugars start to go up. There's a clue that something has happened. Now, <clears throat> this may, makes a rather interesting picture, and I'm going to talk about it in the next slide, but I have two more things that I want to tell you about that are kind of interesting, about insulin. Insulin will stimulate uh, a little receptor on the ovaries called uh, insulin-like growth factor receptors. When insulin levels are high, it'll stimulate those, and the, it stimulates the ovaries to make more estrogen and more testosterone. And the result is polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. This is a very common cause of infertility and irregular menstruation in young women of uh, childbearing age. Kind of a surprise. I first read about this in the uh, early to mid-1990s, and I said, well, that's amazing. Now, every time you go anywhere near an OBGYN meeting, there will be a couple lectures on polycystic ovary syndrome and the, the uh, uh, pre-diabetes picture. Insulin, high insulin levels tend to do this. It's uh, so fascinating. Now, when a woman is having a hard time getting pregnant, they'll often treat the woman with a diabetes medication like metformin to help lower her insulin level so she's more likely to get pregnant. My, this insulin stuff just gets in all kinds of places, doesn't it? Look at this one. Prostate cancer. Not just prostate cancer, but breast cancer and colon, and colon cancer as well. If insulin is a growth factor, tending to make us grow, and cancers are cells that are growing too fast, it stands to reason that maybe too much insulin is going to increase the risk of cancer. Now, we don't know if the insulin is making cancers that are already there grow faster or whether it's actually making cancer cells start. We don't know that. 
but there is an association between these high insulin levels and cancer. And it makes sense to our logic because insulin is a growth hormone. Would you like to get your insulin level down? It's just kind of making sense here, doesn't it? To keep it down a little bit lower. Now, when I went to medical school, my cousin sent a message to me. My cousin said, George, going to medical school is kind of like trying to get a drink out of a fire hydrant. There's a lot coming at you. So I looked for patterns. I noticed when I was in medical school in the pathology class that when someone was overweight, they were more likely to have hypertension, diabetes, and a heart attack. When somebody had a heart attack, they were more likely to have hypertension, uh, diabetes, and to be overweight. They, uh, those, the, the list of problems with each of those diseases was the same. It was easy for me to remember. Now, that was in the early 1980s or late 1970s. And it wasn't until the mid to late 1980s that a fellow by the name of Gerald Reven at Stanford University, hypertensive researcher, gave his talk and he said, I believe that obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension are really just one disease held together by high insulin levels. And the whole world scientific community kind of took sides. This is what happens with the scientific community. <clears throat> Dr. Reven said, this is the way it is. And the other scientists said, uh-uh. And Dr. Reven said, and his group said, uh-huh. So they had an argument now for what? Nearly 20 years. And, and the argument is pretty quiet now because we all see the evidence that this indeed is true. Not that you can't have hypertension from other causes, but the most common cause. And when we start to see this cluster together, we know that this disease is happening. And it has some interesting names. Dr. Reven decided that he was going to call it Syndrome X. Now, I told you he was a hypertensive researcher. And unbeknownst to him, the cardiologists already had this name. Some rare electrical disorder they called Syndrome X. So he said, they said, you can't have it. So now we've got a couple other words that we use. Metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome. And it looks to me like it's going to settle on metabolic syndrome, although my favorite is insulin resistance syndrome. The common name would be prediabetes. That would be a good way to think of it. And because, well, let's look at it a little further here. This is uh, from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2002. So this is old information. The numbers are actually significantly higher now. But when they, uh, this first came out, about 47 million Americans, one out of five adults, two out of five in their 60s and 70s. It is, it's pretty common. We're getting pretty close to uh, half the population, aren't we? And when, as we get a little bit older here. Now, I put these two little pictures up here to remind us that we earn this disease by sitting on our duff too much and by eating too much junk food. Too many calories in, not enough calories out. Okay, how do we make the diagnosis? National Institute of Health gives us a list of five things, and all you have to have is three to have the diagnosis of prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. What are those? Well, a blood pressure greater than 130 over 85, either number, or if you're on a blood pressure medicine to hold it down, that's as good as having it. So if your blood pressure is starting up, that is one of the pieces of evidence. A fasting blood sugar greater than 100. Now, they first started out saying 110 and then lowered it down to 100. That's evidence of problems. Triglycerides over 150. Triglycerides is the fancy name for fat in the blood. And it's one of those things that uh, insulin and insulin resistance makes happen. Then uh, an HDL, or the good cholesterol, it would be low. In men, less than 40 milligra uh, milligrams per deciliter. In women, less than 50. Estrogen tends to raise the, the HDL, but it does not protect against the heart attack when the estrogen does it. And the waist circumference I already mentioned in men, greater than 40 inches. In women, greater than 35 inches. It's at this point when people listening begin to understand that while they thought, oh, it's not my problem, I don't have diabetes, 
they discover that they have prediabetes. If you have three of those, blood pressure's up a little bit, fasting blood sugar's up a little bit, not enough to call it diabetes. Triglycerides over 150, low HDL, or a growing waistline. All of those, three out of the five, makes the diagnosis of prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. Any questions? Does that make sense to you? Well, don't everybody speak at once. If the insulin is uh, as a growth hormone, uh, why don't we grow muscles instead of fat? We do grow some muscles. You know, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I remember there was a guy that was bigger, fatter than I was, about the same height. And I said, hey, this guy's a punk. I'll take him out. That guy was strong. Because every time he got up, he was lifting weight, right? So you have to carry yourself around. And as they do that, as the heavy folks tend to build a lot of muscle. So it's not just fat that they build. They also build muscle. Insulin does build muscle as well as uh, tend to put on fat. Well, insulin makes the whole body get larger. So, yeah, all the way around, that's correct. Good point. Well, I don't see any other hands, so I'll keep, I'll keep talking. Now, you've discovered that uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is something you catch. No, you earn it. <laughs> and you don't catch it, you earn it by sitting too much and not exercising enough. Now there are some other little things that can be involved in the process. For example, too much iron. If you have too much iron in your body, it tends to make the process go faster. If you have not enough magnesium, you know where magnesium comes from in our diet? Magnesium comes from plants. It's in the chlorophyll. Good place to get it, beans and greens. And people who aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables will not have enough magnesium. People who are eating a lot of red meat will have too much iron and these things tend to accelerate. But the underlying problem is too much energy in and not enough energy out. Is it reversible? Well, let's have a look. <clears throat> is obesity reversible? Yes. Uh, we all know people that have lost weight and kept it off. Uh, my mother-in-law is a good example. She's lost quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Hypertension. Is hypertension reversible? Yes, you can, especially with weight coming off. The blood pressure tends to come down, and the literature tells us this. The next one, is coronary artery disease reversible? Dean Ornish ha really helped us out with that. They did the angiograms, they gave people a plant-based diet, regular exercise, stress management, redid the angiograms a year later, covered up everybody's names, sent them from UCSF, that is UC University of California, San Francisco, all the way to Texas, and the uh, radiologists read them all, then they sent them back and looked at the names and did the before and afters, and wow, it actually reversed the coronary artery disease. Well, there it is, the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance syndrome, prediabetes. It's reversible, but what about the diabetes? Is the diabetes reversible? Well, <clears throat> if you've had an amputation, I'm not sure we're going to be able to grow it back. Okay? If your eyes have gone blind, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get it back. If your kidneys are failed, I'm not sure you're going to be able to get There may be some of this that's not reversible. But I can tell you that the insulin resistance is reversible. I've seen kidneys get better. I've never seen them go all the way back to normal. I've seen neuropathy get better. I have seen kidney function improve. It's, I've seen pancreatic function improve. The pancreas kind of gets weak in this as well. It gets tired of yelling, and its uh, function starts to drop. So there is, and the truth is that earlier you start to do something about it, the earlier you de deal with the underlying problem, the more easily it is to reverse it.
Is that encouraging? Is that good news? Yeah. So, <clears throat> how are you going to reverse it? What's the clue? What's the trick? You're going to decrease the energy in, and you're going to increase the energy out. That is exercise more. That's pretty basic, isn't it? I give this lecture to fifth and sixth graders, and their response is, you know, I tell them, okay, I'm the patient, you're the doctor. What, what am I supposed to do? Exercise and eat less. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Now, <clears throat> that's sometimes easier said than done. Uh, we have to make some lifestyle choices. We've gotten used to living the way we have, and, and it's hard to turn that around. I was uh, in my office <clears throat> minding my, uh, no, minding my patient's business. Back and forth between uh, the rooms, and there was a young fella, no, middle-aged fella, an Italian businessman, came into my office and he said, Doc, I got a problem. I'd never seen him before. I said, what's your problem? He says, I got some spots on my skin. I don't recognize them. And so he showed them to me and they were like 0.8 centimeters, maybe there were three or four of them, kind of clustered. There was no redness at all on these spots. They weren't pigmented, they were more yellow. They were f raised and flat, and it took me half a minute to figure it out. But then my brain kicked, and I said, I think those are cholesterol deposits. Cholesterol deposits? Well, I said, I think that's what they are. Uh, let's check your cholesterol. If your cholesterol is high, then I won't feel like I need to biopsy them, because I'm pretty sure. If their um, cholesterol is not high, then I kind of doubt that it's uh, cholesterol, and we'd have to biopsy. So... <clears throat> I got out the little sheet and I started checking. I want the cholesterol and the triglycerides and the LDL and the HDL and we'll send him off to the lab to get his lab done. Now I remembered back to medical school. In medical school I learned that when uh, someone had uh, high cholesterol, heart disease, they were more likely to have hypertension and I looked at his chart and yeah, he had high blood pressure. And I, I, or more likely to have obesity. And I looked at him and I knew he had obesity. I said, I, I'm going to check his sugar, too. So I just put a little check on that box. I said, let's get the sugar. So he came back a week later, and uh, I looked at the results. His cholesterol was over 300. Whoa! I said, that's what your yellow spots are from, cholesterol. My eye went on down the sheet, and there at the bottom was the blood sugar. The blood sugar, fasting, was over 200. I said, uh, <clears throat> did anybody ever tell you you had uh, diabetes? He said, no. I said, well, <clears throat> your blood sugar is pretty high. And technically, I'm not supposed to make the diagnosis with uh, just one blood sugar. I need two of them to do that. But, you know, you're pretty healthy. And in those days, we made the diagnosis at 140. And his fasting was 200. Wow. I went on to say, you know, we've got to control your blood sugars. We've got problems with, with uh, blindness, with kidney failure, with neuropathy, with amputations. You don't want to do that. So we need to get your blood sugars under control. Uh, in my experience, uh, well, I'm taught that I'm supposed to tell you about diet and lifestyle. And I said, I'll spend a little time with that. But with my ex in my experience, uh, I think you're probably going to need a pill with the blood sugar that's that's hot, that's that high. And he sat there, taking it right in. You know, after, with the time, you learn uh, when people are actually paying attention to you and getting it. And I thought he was getting it. Then I said to him, now, in my experience, sir, blood sugar's over 200. Uh, pills are often not enough, and often we have to start insulin. Now, when I said that, this quiet, calm Italian businessman turned into a veritable Vesuvius. Doc, I don't care what happens, I'd rather die. I'll never take insulin. I don't care. I just will never take insulin. Don't try to make me do it. I will never do it. <clears throat> well, I'd been around long enough to know that you don't <coughs> fight stubbornness head on. <laughs> so I just waited quietly till the volcano kind of calmed down. And then I said, I'll tell you what. If you'll do what I tell you to do, as long as your blood sugars are coming down, I won't say anything about pills, I won't say anything about insulin. 
He said, Doc, I'll do it. I'll do anything. I'd been thinking. This was in the kind of mid-1980s, and the literature was coming out. Insulin resistance, too much energy in, not enough energy out. Muscles are saying no. And I had been thinking about this information as it was coming out. Uh, when I was in the shower at night, or sometimes you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're kind of just thinking about things, you know. So I'm trying to solve this problem. Well, if diabetes is not something you catch, it's something you earn, then there should be something we should do to turn this thing around. And it made sense to me that we just decrease the energy in and increase the energy out, and that the best way to do that would be to get somebody's stomach completely empty and then send them out to exercise. I mean, that's pretty basic, isn't it? So I come up with a plan. I knew from physiology class in medical school about fasting. Have you all ever heard of fasting? Some people think of fasting as a spiritual sort of a thing, and I suppose it is in some people's minds. Some people think of fasting as uh, horrors. Uh, I'm hungry. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing for me to eat. Uh, it's, it's a bad state of affairs. <laughs> Physiology from a physiologic state means energy is coming from storage. It's not coming from your intestines. There's the fed state and there's the fasting state. The fed state is we're getting energy from our food. The fasting state, we're getting energy from storage. Now, the textbooks said that it takes 8 to 12 hours after the last meal to reach the fasting state. So I was thinking, and I passed this information on to this gentleman. I said, here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to have a, either eliminate or have a very small evening meal. <clears throat> Why? Because if you had a big meal at noon and nothing thereafter, then somewhere around midnight, your body would be switching over to what we would call the fasting state. Then, <clears throat> while you're sleeping at night, your body's in this fasting state, and when you get up in the morning, I told him, I want you to do some exercise. I'm not going to tell you how far, how long, or even what to do. I just want you to do what you can do. So he thought he could do that. I talked to him a little bit about food. It was rather simple. Um, do you like apples? Oh, I love apples. One, two, three apples, and I'm getting full. But you know those apples could be smashed up, put in a glass at the end of your knife, and you would take seven to eight apples worth of apple juice and think nothing of it. It would just be part of the meal. Uh, is apple juice bad? No, but apples are a lot better. We try to decrease the calories in. We'd like lots of fiber and less energy. We want to be full. We don't want to be hungry all the time, but we want few calories. Corn. Do you like corn? Oh, yeah, I love corn. Seven to eight ears of corn and a corn roast, I'm just one happy man, you know, a little salt, a little sand for effect, and, and a, a corn roast can be a great thing. But you can smash that corn up, put it in a bottle, you've seen them, corn oil, no cholesterol. You buy it, you take it home, you make salad dressing, and you pour 16 to 18 ears worth of corn oil on your salad. Now, is corn oil bad? No, it's probably one of the better oils, but the truth is, corn is a lot better than corn oil. So minimize the corn oil, maximize the corn. He seemed to be getting it, so I tried one more. I said, sir, do you eat grass? He said, no. I said, are you sure the cow eats grass? And concentrates all those, excuse the pun, calories. <laughs> so when you eat the animal products, you're getting no fiber and lots of calories. So if you're going to use animal products, I said, use it as a condiment. Better to have a little ground beef with your beans than a steak. That would be a mistake. Yeah. Better to have a little uh, fish or chicken in your soup than to have the whole filet or the whole drumstick. So try to eat plant food as close as you can to the way God made it. And I sent him out the door with a prescription for a glucose machine instructions to come back and have my nurse teach him how to use it. And then I was going to see him back in about 10 days. He came back 10 days later. I checked his uh, numbers. He had some for me, and his blood sugars were still very high, but they were less than they were before. 
So I didn't say anything about insulin, and I didn't say anything about pills. I said, how did it go? And he said, Doc, the first morning, these are his words, I waddled 50 feet from the front door and then came back. By the time, you know, the 10 days were up, he was already going a quarter of a mile. And with time, he got, he got better and better. He added exercise in the evening. He was watching his, his diet carefully, eating a lot of plants, minimizing animal products, and over time, he just got better and better. I remember finally seeing him again at one year. After this diagnosis, this terrible diagnosis of diabetes, his blood sugars were normal. Fasting blood sugars were under 100. He had no diabetes medication. I hadn't said anything about insulin. I hadn't said anything about pills because it kept getting better. His blood pressure was now normal. I looked at the chart. He has lost 60 pounds. We checked his cholesterol. It was normal. Well, in those days, it wouldn't be normal now. It was still uh, above uh, 200, but it was like 230, something like that. Significantly better than the way it was. This was the first time in my life I had ever seen this whole business reverse with lifestyle change. This man's stubbornness had led him to change his lifestyle. With that change in lifestyle, that disease had apparently gone away. He told me, Doc, last week I wanted to know what would happen, so I tried a little ice cream, and you know what? My blood sugar didn't go up very high. It came right back down. Now, I felt a little bit uh, embarrassed, I suppose. It's not the right word, but I think you understand what I mean. You know, <clears throat> when the patient comes in to see the doctor, the doctor is supposed to help the patient. And uh, I saw this fellow, and we just said, blood sugar is okay, blood pressure is okay. Weight's nice, <laughs> cholesterol's good. I mean, I was finished with my job. It's like, I'll see you later. But I'd never seen this happen before, and I was quite impressed. So I wanted to hear it one more time, and I said to him, Sir, it's been one year since we made this diagnosis of diabetes. A and look, hey, this is incredible. You know, those were dramatic changes that we asked you to make. How did it go? What do you think? And his face got kind of serious. And he kind of furrowed his brow, and he said, well, Doc, there was one problem. I said, well, what was that? Couldn't think what it could be. He looked good to me. He said, well, Doc, this last year, I had, I, I had two custom suits made, and when I got them home, they were both too big. <laughs> then he smiled at me. <laughs> And uh, I knew he got me. I never saw Ralph again. I said, Ralph, you come back when you got problems. I'd be happy to see you for your annual physical. I'm embarrassed having you come back in and see me. You obviously don't have this disease anymore. So <clears throat> I, uh, I never saw him again. I worked in that office for another two and a half or three years and then left. Uh, and I called back. I was curious about it. I asked for, the, for Ralph's records. And, they sent him to me, and I checked Ralph's records. And, you know, about a year after I had left, Ralph had shown up at the office again, and he had a sinus infection. So they treated that, and, and Ralph didn't need the doctor anymore. Now, isn't that the way it should be? You see, when you deal with the underlying cause, increase the energy in and decrease... No, that was backwards, wasn't it? <laughs> you decrease the energy in, and you increase the energy out then you can reverse the underlying process, as long as it hasn't gone so far as to be irreversible. So the diabetes tends to take care of itself. Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. You know, I never checked him again. <laughs> yeah, me too. They were on his genitals. It was kind of an embarrassing place to look. You know, I'd never seen them there before. I, they, I don't know. I, I, I see them more commonly around the eyes, uh, and I don't know whether they went away. I, it, it wasn't important, and I never went back looking. It was kind of in a private spot. So, yeah. Yes? We learned this last week that you can overcome genetics um, if you were predisposed to certain diseases. And I'm wondering about young kids. If it's in the family history, uh, you would be more aware that you might be more susceptible to that? Nurses' health study, I tried to look at that. They had took a whole bunch of nurses, several thousand, and looked at them prospectively. 
they took their lifestyle parameters, if you will, what were they were eating, how much exercise, how much sleep, how much water, I mean, all those things. <clears throat> and then they look at them over time and see who gets diabetes. Then they go back and look at which lifestyle components best decided who was going to get diabetes. They found that 91% of the diabetes was explainable by those lifestyle choices. People with very strong genetics, 88% was uh, lifestyle. We, we say uh, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. I mean, that's one way to say it. But now you know, from what we've taught you here, that it is the natural physiologic response to too, many too much energy in and not enough energy out. It is true, there are some people who are a little more likely, if you will, to, to get it. There may be some genetic component, but most of it, most of it is lifestyle. It's not something you have to get. Yes? Yes, Dr. The previous lecture I heard you give regarding Alzheimer's disease. Yes, yes. You had mentioned that there was some research going on that seemed to indicate that uh, diabetes was kind of or, or rather, I think you, you phrased it like that Alzheimer's, there's a theory that Alzheimer's may be a diabetes of the brain. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could just mention a little bit about that research, and if that proves to be true, then if we avoid diabetes, may also be lowering the, our possibility of getting Alzheimer's. You are correct about that. The people who have diabetes have almost three times the risk of getting Alzheimer's. Uh, so that's kind of the response, I remember 2.8 or 2.6, something like that, more times to get diabetes. If you change your lifestyle to make your diabetes go away, those lifestyle changes also tend to protect against Alzheimer's disease. So yes, you're right about that. And I don't remember whether they mentioned it or not, but they've even uh, taken people with Alzheimer's disease and given them some insulin. Can't give too much or you make your blood sugar go too low. Give them a little bit of insulin and their brains tend to work better. So there's some kind of rationale for saying, yeah, I, I think there may be some insulin resistance in the brain. <clears throat> Sometimes the neuroscientists wanted to call it type 3 diabetes. Yes. Just type 2 diabetes. Yes. With so many people in this country obese, what percentage of that would you say is, has actually been diagnosed? Are there lots of people still running around that for one reason or another are unaware they have diabetes? The estimates are about half of the uh, people with diabetes have actually been diagnosed and the other half are still running around kind of unknown. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this term? I think maybe we mentioned it before, diabesity. Okay, obesity and diabetes to put the words together because the obesity is the cause. Every pound you gain is a step towards diabetes. Every pound you lose is a step away. So it's important to keep that weight down and to keep that energy balanced. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the relationship with the pregnant di uh, diabetes. Yes. And also stress with the diabetes. Okay. Um, when they have more stress, they, the blood sugar goes up. And she was explaining about the pregnant diabetes. Uh, the ladies with uh, pregnancy, uh, they call it gestational diabetes. It's just like type 2 diabetes, but instead of inactivity being the cause or the major cause of the insulin resistance, it's the pregnancy hormones. So they have a little bit of inactivity and a little bit of kind of borderline muscle insulin resistance, and then you add the hormones on top, and it turns them into diabetics as long as they have the pregnancy hormones. But one-third of ladies who get uh, gestational diabetes will go on to get type 2 diabetes because it's the same process. It's just that the hormones have unmasked it. Now, you also asked about stress hormones. Stress hormones uh, are against insulin, and they tend to make insulin resistance worse. So it's common, for example, for someone who has been kind of smoldering along with prediabetes to go into the hospital to have a surgery, some sort of a major stress, and it kind of pushes the body over into, now we call it diabetes. 
The process has been happening for a long time, but the stress tends to push it over the edge. Make sense? Yeah, but is, is that reversible at all? Or? Yes, uh huh. Yes, one has to exercise and decrease the calories in with adequate nutrition. You don't want inadequate nutrition. You'd like lots of good nutrients, but many fewer calories. And the ideal food for that is plant food because it's high in, we call it nutrient dense. But still, uh, well, you cannot, uh, it will not uh, remove the stress because the job is very stressful. So, um. Well, then one has to overcome the stress hormone with exercise. And interestingly enough, exercise uh, is the best counteractor for stress. Uh, you, can, you can help calm the stress in your body, the physiologic stress, by exercising, because the exercise counteracts the stress hormones. There was another one, hand here. Going back to what Keith's saying, are yes. uh, you saying that most people who have the tendency to get that disease, uh, the diabetes, do they have to what, watch their diet greater, or do more exercise or something? Or, you know, it would be wise if they did both, because it's a balance between the two. That is, Make sure their calories are down. I would recommend eliminating or skipping that evening meal so it's small before you go to bed so you can actually reach the fasting state. Remember, the fasting state is the opposite of the diabetic state. Fasting state is energy from storage. And if energy is coming from storage, then the body is moving away from the diabetes. When there's too much energy and it's going into storage, then you're moving towards diabetes. You don't want to lose pounds. Well, there's benefit as far as the diabetes is concerned from losing pounds, as long as it's not muscle pounds. Yes? The monster, the nighttime monster. <laughs> you all ever seen that monster? They don't live under the bed. They live in the refrigerator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've seen that one too. <clears throat> Best thing to do is to pour a glass of water on top of it, you know, nice cold water, and it'll kind of put out the fire, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> Our bodies get very used to eating, and if we usually have a midnight snack, the body will say, hey, where's that snack? Okay? So it doesn't take long. It's only a couple of weeks to retrain it, and, and, it'll, and it'll retrain away. That monster will, you know, roll up and die until you feed it next time, and it'll get up and say, I've, I've had this happen to me. You're not eating any evening meal, okay? And then I got a Saturday night where somebody, we're going to somebody's house, and they, and they feed you, you know, and you have, okay, some popcorn and nap a little bit. Sunday night, that monster's going to say, aren't you going to feed me? <laughs> That's exactly what happens. But you say, shut up, pour the water on top, and the next night it's a whole lot quieter. Okay. So our body is very trainable that way, simply because, especially if you're gaining weight, uh, it's uh, your, your body is often crying for food out of habit rather than reality, okay? And water is supposed to slow that down. Well, uh, water dilutes any acid in the stomach, okay? It puts something in the stomach so that the brain gets half the message, oh, there's something in the stomach, well, it must not be all that bad. And of course, there's no sugar in it so that you don't have the insulin release and all the, the calories that come in with it. It's really hard to have snacks, you know, <clears throat> They advertise these snacks. I'll bet you can't eat one, right? And uh, it, it's just, if you're anything like me, once I get started, it's much harder to stop. So it's just better to just cut it off and say, no. I'll take that water, and uh, that'll calm it down. I saw another hand over here. What about juices? You say grape juice and orange juice. Where are you? 
In my opinion, juices are, should not be considered health foods. They are highly concentrated calories. Orange juice, you know, we say, oh, that's supposed to make a good breakfast. But when you take, uh, some people ask me about juicers, too. You know, they'll have a champion juicer, and they'll put all that stuff in. Normally, when we eat, we eat for about, it takes about 15 minutes for the messages to get from our stomach to our brain saying, okay, I, you're full now, you don't need it. Now, some of us will go longer than that, 15, maybe 20 minutes, but it's about 15 minutes for the little hormones from your gut to get to your brain. If you put this in a juicer, you can put down buku calories before 15 minutes comes. If you have to chew the stuff, it goes down a little slower, which means you put fewer calories in. Juicing can really increase the caloric density of your meal. It increases the amount of calories you get in because they go down quickly. Now, <clears throat> if you're 90 years of age, okay, and lying in bed all the time, your teeth are gone, and they've given up putting you know, plates or anything in, and, and you can't take anything else, then that makes sense. But if you're <clears throat> young and healthy, like you are, you shouldn't be taking a bunch of juice. If you're going to have it, use it as small amounts and recognize that it's concentrated calories. Question. Yes, ma'am. Are there any physical signs of diabetes other than, you know, when you go to the doctor to predict with the blood test? I mean, like fainting or weakness? Or well, wouldn't that be nice? Who was it was telling me today um, that they ha have got a friend who uh, has diabetes and he doesn't want to do anything about it. Oh, it was the guy I play racquetball with. He says, I, I was out, I had lunch with a friend of mine, and, and he says, I've got neuropathy in my feet. Um, <clears throat> well, are you taking your pills? He says, no, I haven't taken my pills in five years. I feel pretty good. What do your blood sugar usually run? Oh, four to 500. <laughs> well, I feel pretty good, you know, there can't be any problem. And that's the problem with diabetes. You don't feel bad until you're over the edge. And often, if it's a heart attack, 50%, no, th about 30% of the time, death is your first symptom. You know, it's not very good. So that's why we have to do the screening. And when we do the screening, sometimes people are just saying, well, I feel good or I don't feel good. Uh, that's not a good way to tell. You've got to do something about it. That blood sugar is high. It's pretty common. The symptoms are often, for example, when the blood sugar goes over 200, the sugar starts to spill in the urine, and it works as a diuretic, so people start urinating a bunch. They get up a bunch at night to urinate because there's a lot of sugar pulling water out. They're dehydrated all the time. So I've had people uh, who the very first symptom of their diabetes was neuropathy. Uh, so, and then the doctor's looking at you, right? You can see your weight's up, see blood pressure's up, cholesterol's up. Uh, it's pre-diabetes. I guess we better check the blood sugar. So we're watching that whole pattern, and most all doctors are very aware of it now. Yes, sir? Well, the, <coughs> what about the exercise when you get where you can't do it? This is a real challenge. Exercise, I, I, it feels like a cliff to me. Once you start to go over that cliff so you can't exercise, it's really hard. And what I do to help people like that is to recommend a pool or an exercise bicycle, some way to exercise that doesn't take so much knee and joint and sometimes even heart. And then we kind of watch carefully and, and uh, help people increase their exercise. So. We used to walk about two miles every morning, but I can't do that now. That can be a challenge. An exercise bicycle is a nice way to do that. Uh, some people have swimming pools in their uh, homes, especially in Florida, and those can be very helpful, uh, but not everybody has those. Yeah. So, would you say mostly raw vegetables, but better, let's say? I really didn't comment on raw versus cooked. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. I, what I would like to do, I think a, a mixture is good. Vegetables, okay, the above ground vegetables have about 200 calories for every pound. Can you imagine eating a pound of broccoli? Right? No. <laughs> or a pound of carrots? I mean, you'd be full. 
and only 200 calories. So when we talk about plant food, what we're looking for is a lot of bulk, a lot of fiber, and few calories. Fruits, you know, you're pushing up to four or 500 uh, calories per pound. But a pound of fruit is a lot of fruit too, right? Uh, so that's, that's where we try to uh, aim at fruits, vegetables, whole grains come in there. They, they're getting closer to 500, but uh, whole grains are also good. So legumes, beans, those types of things are also in that, that good range, if you will. Uh, we should eat as, uh, really, that's where we should eat most of our food. Not that you can't have some of the others, but you need to eat a lot in, those, in that area. And then, of course, exercise. And that fills you up. Yes, ma'am. How much exercise do you have to do to get rid of stress? Well, I found that it doesn't take all that much. Uh, 20 or 30 minutes of some vigorous exercise and the stress hormones kind of turn around. The emotional stress hormone is noradrenaline. It constricts the blood vessels in the muscles. It makes you feel tight, kind of gives you a headache. Exercise and you get more of the adrenaline coming out. And the adrenaline opens up the blood vessels. It really doesn't take that long to help that stress go away. Exercise is a great antidepressant as well. And the science tells us it's as strong as taking a pill. You get somebody to exercise, it'll do as much as taking a pill. Uh, I, would, I think exercise is great. We should all be doing it uh, much more than we do. We have a sedentary society. Yes, ma'am. This is really bad news because it's, you're telling me that I have to do something now. Yes. <laughs> How can we get help with doing what we're going to do? Well, the first piece is to understand, right? Now you know where diabetes comes from. Type 2 diabetes comes from too much energy in, not enough energy out. So you need to know you're, that you're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn to another direction. And I can encourage you towards uh, taking, eating a lot of plants. I think that's excellent. You don't have to become a... <coughs> vegetarian, okay? <laughs> you just have to eat lots of plants. And when you take animal products, you take small amounts. One more. How much what? How many calories? It's different for everybody. Uh, what we want to do is to get the calories low that you're eating, lower than what you're exercising so you can lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Better yet, okay, eat the foods that don't have labels, okay? <laughs> We're talking about potatoes and carrots and celery and beets and you know when you go to the when you shop, you don't have to go to the health food store and you don't have to have organic, you know, it's all good stuff. Get it with good flavor and good color, and that's the way you go, okay? If it's got more than two ingredients on the label, leave it there. <laughs> yes, sir? For exercise, which, which machine would be better? Would it be a bicycle or the treadmill? Which is better, a bicycle or a treadmill? You need to use the muscles between your knees and your bottom of your rib cage. That's where most of your muscles are. So whatever you can do, if somebody's knees are bothering them, I'd put them on the bicycle. You'll do better uh, if, you've, if you've got good knees, you'll get better exercise on the treadmill. But you could use the rowing machine, that would be fine. And uh, preferably, uh, walk outside. The weather is beautiful, you get some light in your eyes. And See, I like climbing stairwell. Yes. I have been climbing for a long time. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Do what you can. Do what you can. Okay, thank you. We've had a good time. I'll be here afterwards to answer questions if you have some. So.